Hi, I'm Edwin Samuelson, and welcome to The Cinephiles, a show that allows you to eavesdrop on the conversations of fellow film fanatics. Uh, today, one of our esteemed com uh, co-hosts could not be here, Mr. Jeff Gallishaw, because he's working hard for the man every night and day, to quote uh, Creedence Clearwater Revival. Uh, but let Were me you going to call him a colleague or a comrade? A comrade in arms. Duh. Uh, that's about the mustache, man. All right, well, well, who is here today? Mr. Uh, Eric Cohen to my left, and to his left... Michael Fultz. What does having a mustache have to do with I, I don't think, know. I, mean, I think Ed I wants understand. us to refer to him as young Stalin tonight. Yes, I want you to do as I tell you. Okay. But anyway, before I begin, let's uh, let me just say this. We uh, as I don't as many of you know, we've started a blog which is on cinephilestv.blogspot.com. Uh, we've, uh, we've had this for about a month now, and we've gotten some really good responses. Eric has written a couple of reviews. Uh, Jeff has, and Mike so has also Mike. written some, some of his sarcastic, witty reviews. And I have also done a video entry for the Deaf Wish series, and I plan on doing some more video entries. And I hope you'll check that out. Also, if you're watching this on, on YouTube, please leave a comment and rate the show and subscribe if you haven't. Just point and click if you are watching this on Facebook. You heard me, fellow fans. You agree with me on that, don't you? They can take the time to rate the damn show. Give you us mean, a five. You mean YouTube or Facebook? On YouTube. Right. I agree. Uh, and so subscribe, damn it. We here, want here. some subscribers and we want some comments and we want some video responses. And we want to thank our friends for the people who have, have responded. Those yeah, have been I was some great say, resp I responses. Say, I want to say a big thank you to all our fans who uh, <clears throat> actively post on both Facebook and on, especially on YouTube for their comments. Even even the jackasses that leave their miserable, thoughtless, negative comments that we will never ever listen to and we would probably think nothing of. We appreciate those too. Hey, I appreciate it because you know what that means. They watched the episode and that they got had enough. They had enough yeah. anger or feeling to respond. Yeah, I mean, Fully. That provoked those, the response. Especially on the John Hughes show, like half those comments. I think most of those people have shit for brains, but you know, I'm glad they posted. So am I. Hey, and John Hughes, rest in peace, pal. All right. Well, let's get into this first topic of today, which is we're we talking about a classic. We got some requests for this, and I think it's a very good topic. It's Planet of the Apes. We're going to talk about the entire Planet of the Apes series. Uh, from the Charlton Heston uh, version uh, through, uh, through the uh, Tim Burton remake or relaunch, if whatever you want to call it, or reimagining. The entire canon of apes. Um, as many people will know, the book, there was a book written called Monkey Planet by a very famous writer named Pierre Bruel, I believe is his name. He also was a very famous French writer who wrote one of the greatest films of my, uh, my lifetime. I, well, not my lifetime, but I think one of the best I've ever seen in my lifetime, which is Vertigo. And uh, he's a very respected uh, writer, and he wrote a film about a, a sp basically a human that crashes on a planet, a futuristic planet of apes. Unfortunately, uh, the budget wouldn't allow it, so they had to make it a primitive tribe of apes. But the film was Planet of the Apes. It starred Charlton Heston in perhaps his first of his many science fiction roles. He would later go on to do Swing at Green and Well, it wasn't just Omega Boulay, Man. but Rod Serling also Rod Serling had a part in it. Yeah. Well, Rod, Rod Serling, Serling wrote the screenplay. The yeah. novel was written by Boulay. Boulay also wrote uh, Diabolique, Rod, which is a course. Which is a classic. Yes, one of the films the that The movie is based on his novel as well. That, that influenced Alfred Hitchcock quite a bit when he made Psycho, I believe. Um, yes. But, um, yeah, Planet of the Apes is one of the uh, most... Well, what it, no, but it was, you know, and you just touched on this briefly. Yeah. It was a very interesting vision of the futuristic ape society that Boulay had envisioned. I mean, you're right. Of course, there was no budget that was going to have basically apes and jet packs and floating cars and stuff. And then well, well, well just, just, just to clarify with our audience, the vision that's in the film was not Boulay's vision. Exactly. No, it was not. It was, it was exactly. toned down by 20th century Although Fox. it was going to be, because there's test footage of that Edward G. Edward G. Robinson was going to be um, uh, Dr. Dr. Sayas. Dr. Sayas, and he's wearing contemporary clothing. And they, I mean, they're, they're originally going to clothe uh, and they and also the had uh, They also had uh, storyboards all right. uh, ready to go. And many of those, 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 story, those storyboards and uh, test footage is available on a great making of the Planet of the Apes documentary. Um, the film is legendary. It has been parodied many times. It was directed by a very, I mean, an excellent director, Franklin J. Schaffner, or Schaffner, who also directed Pepion and many other films. Um, this film is very intelligent. A lot of it, it comes from the, the pen of Rod Serling, I believe, whose cynical nature mm -hmm. really does add quite a bit to the film. I think, I think, you know, I never read the original Boulay text, but I will say, and you, you touch on a great point, the cynical nature or vision that Rod Serling brings to the original story is really, really brought to what I think is my favorite part of the film, which is the first third. I love the whole 
desolation of what these three astronauts should have been four, but of course there was a uh, a hairline crack, a in mishap, the, uh, a mishap yeah, in the uh, in the uh, cryogenic chamber that the female astronaut was in. But still, when you when these three astronauts are roaming around, I I just love that. I mean, it's like pure survival. You don't know where they're at. You just know that it's a planet that's you know has air, not much vegetation at first. And I, and I you know what I also like about it too is, and I didn't realize this, uh, you know, because I, I saw it many times as a kid, but I only rewatched it recently because you know Fox TV, you know the Fox Movie Channel, yeah, they has been reshowing these like all the yeah. back to back, and I, I managed to revisit them recently, and I didn't realize how much of a douchebag Charlton Heston is. He's a real jerk. He's like he's introduced when very, he's like first introduced. He's such a jerk. He's just like this total douchebag asshole commander of their team, and. You he's know, very he's, cynical. He's almost yeah. like anti-human race. Like he wants the yeah, human he, race. He, he but I get how this film is sort of like his. Uh, sort but I of like, like that though. I like him just. He has being an such arc a jerk. where he starts to rediscover his own humanity. Well, I think that's what's so great about the film is him trying to convey. There's a whole point where he <clears> can. He actually, as you find out, the planet is overrun with apes who can speak and who actually are. The the I say the primary uh, what, what are the, the intelligent life? Well, on the they planet. don't when they don't find that out first. They find human beings. But who they're are slaves, all, and yeah, they're just they're, they're almost just, like cattle. Basically, they're they're basically chimpanzees. They're like monkeys. They're just they're just there and a nuisance to the apes. And the thing is, this is that I love that the whole point is that Charlton Heston loses his voice, and the whole time he knows and he wants to express himself and say, "Hey, I'm not one of these things." And the build up to that very famous line of "Get your damn stinking paws off me, you damn dirty ape," is legendary, and it's such a powerful moment because for that whole hour, you always go, "Can come on, speak." I, I love the film. I, I, cause let me tell you what, I was very lucky, even though I've seen the ending, which I'm not going to ruin for anybody who hasn't seen it. The ending I've seen well, parodied. Well, just fell out of a cave yesterday. I don't know. I know. I, it's funny. When I was a kid, I saw a movie called Spaceballs, which, mm -hmm. of course, makes fun of the ending of the movie. Right. It's been made fun of many times. It, yeah, it's very different. funny, actually. But when I saw the movie, thankfully, years later, I had no idea of the ending. And when the ending came, it completely shocked and just blew me off. It really, this is a two hour Twilight Zone with a good budget. Well, that's what it is. I mean, that's Ross Link's that. touch. It's basically a feature length Twilight Zone episode. It reminds but me of the Burgess Meredith episode with him losing the it's glasses. It's very well done. It's, it's, it's also a very exciting film. I think some of the action scenes, the chase scenes, the you know, they're very well paced. There's a lot of suspense. I think well the, the, the social satire is very well done, even though it gets a little kind of too on the nose in, a, you know, in the court you know, scene. You know, semen when, hues, when they're all doing the see. like, see no evil, hear no evil thing in court, you know. You, you know, human see human do but that's uh, a very yeah. famous line but uh you know it, it's, it's an interesting film and it's kind of like i like how like the fates of, of some of the characters are left kind of ambiguous at the end you know even though charlton hessen leaves them behind you know that dr Sayas Sy is not going to keep his promise and, and let the other you know chimpanzees go you know you mm -hmm. mean the humans no, the chimpanzees. No, oh, the ch yeah, ch yeah, remember, yeah. he said, that I promise, I'll let you know they won't be held accountable for you know being traitors, or whatever. Right. Cornelius, or is it Cornelius? Cornelius and, and, uh, Cornelius and Zira. And Zira. Zira. And, and then and then at the end, he's, he he said he said you know after like Charlton Heston goes off in the sunset on his horse with his his woman, he, he says to him, arrest them immediately. And so I thought you had you know you you, you you what what about your word? And he's like, I was never planning on keeping my word. You know, uh, you guys had to be held accountable. And I love the whole thing is that that at the end, of course, you find out that Dr. Zayas is fully mm -hmm. aware of everything. Yeah. Taylor was aware of was talking about, but they were trying to hide, which actually is another thing of social commentary on, you know, maybe communism and things back then. I think it's perhaps the reigning science fiction film of its time. It's absolutely brilliant, and we have to give credit to. This movie would not be half as good as it, was, as it is if it wasn't for the work of John Chambers. His makeup in this movie mm -hmm. is absolutely excellent and convincing. It, it is his makeup test that actually made the executives of Fox green light the picture because they, they, they did not believe they could actually make an actor look like an ape and make him believable. Mm -hmm. But when they did the makeup test with actually James Brolin and Edward G. Robinson, um, who were actually James Edward G. Robinson, they said the makeup was too tiresome, so they recast it with Morris Evans. Or James Brolin. And James could have been in Planet of the Apes. Yes, could have been James Bond. But uh, hey, but you come easy. But he was go. in the TV series Hotel. But yes. Almost as and good. And Amityville Horror is Paul Bunyan. All right. But it's definitely one of the best and one of Jerry Goldsmith's best scores. It's yeah, terrific amazing, score by Jerry yeah, Goldsmith. Score. Um, but this is definitely one of the best science fiction films, one of the most influential, and f f set a, a uh, made a cr created a universe of four more films of mm -hmm. various qualities. In fact, the next film in the series is Beneath Planet of the Apes, which actually 
as flawed as it is, this might be my favorite uh, entry in terms of ideas going around. I love it this is, film. It is, my, it is my favorite out of the whole yeah. series. I think that as the first one is best. As much as I love Planet of, the, uh, Planet of the Apes. Just the ideas are brilliant. But this one is, it's like a mix brilliant. between, yeah, you're right. It is flawed. Some but this things ideas in there are, are very, brilliant. Very, very, very jo you know, some silly things in there. But you're right. The ideas in there are so fucking amazing that I just... I just I, I, was I, I loved it. it. Seems. I, I could watch that movie over and over and over again. I just I the the because it it picks up almost exactly where the other one left off. Literally, it picks off where it goes yeah. up where Taylor on his on his horse at the end of the movie, and he stumbles into the forbidden zone as you find out, and uh, he somehow somehow disappears, and Nova, his companion, uh, runs away and is able to whatever. But anyway, a, a rescue mission was followed uh, Charlton Heston's character, and I guess follows the same trajectory. And, and who would you want better to come rescue you than James Franciscus? He's, I mean, he really is a, another, he's like a poor <laughs> man's Chuck like Heston. <laughs> no, I think he's actually a really good choice. He's a poor no, no, man. I, he's, I, he's really I good him. in the role. Like yeah, no, James Franciscus was perfect cast. He's not a great actor, but he was... He had the look. The idea was he was supposed to be... It, it, this is another interesting take on the hero part, and that... He, he, this is a guy who really doesn't know what the fuck is going on. And I, I like how he's not even like, don't even attempt like like another leading character to get it on with the female character. This is completely about trying to figure out what's going on here, how he got here, and then he discovers Charlton Heston. And, you know, I, I like a lot of the ideas in the film. Too. Yes, it's flawed. You Very know, flawed. I think I think Planet the of the budget. Apes of all the films are, is the best made film in the entire course, series. But this is my favorite. But there's a lot of like, shall I say pulp Value yeah, to this no, film? No, not shall you say it is definitely you know, pulpy all that's over just, the place. Just a lot of fun, you know. The mutated humans, you know, they come across. And well, the thing is, this is what I think is interesting is that Charlton Heston was asked to come back for a sequel, and he said, "I don't want to be in it. I did it already, and that's mm -hmm. that." He and then they kept, you know, pestering me. He said, "Okay, I'll do it, but I want you to. I'll be uh, in one scene in the beginning to hand it off to someone else." He goes, "Will you be at the beginning and at the end?" And he said, "Okay, I'll do it." And his, I, he said, and I want this never to continue. I want to basically make this movie where it's the final entry. And what the way that he did it, ingeniously mm -hmm. created three more sequels, uh, which I'm not going to give away to you right now. But I like this one because I love the underground city, which actually uses sets from Hello Dolly. And yeah. the, I don't know if you know yeah, that. I, knew that. Th yeah, I thought I that know was that. brilliant. Actually, there's an A/B comparison online. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. It's like, whoa, Barbara Streisand, and this is the underground mutated city. Well, she probably looks like a mutant anyway, but uh, I uh, yeah. But I love how the, the 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 there is humans who have evolved, you know, to the next level with like telepathic abilities. But and you they, know what I like? I like the contrast between the two because both the apes and the mutated humans underneath the 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 mental mutants or whatever they're called, uh, both really lack a great deal of compassion and humanity. They're both very cold, fascistic societies. Mm -hmm. Well, the one thing is this. They what? don't believe in violence. Uh, them creating violence, the humans. They, 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 with their powers, let humans create, vi or not humans, but the other people well, attack they, they, themselves. They, yeah, they use their telekinesis and, you know. And, and I just recall seeing that scene where, where they make uh, Hessen and, and uh, Fran Franciscus, you know. Fight uh, in the cage. Yeah, you know, I kept thinking Star Trek. That's what I was like, dun, 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 Sorry, the arena comes into, uh, comes into play in that one. You know what's so funny? I saw that print at Walter Reed Cinema. <laughs> wow. And, hey, pretty good, huh? I've been on a Star Trek. Uh, hey, watch. We did a Star Trek episode. Watch it on on, a, on YouTube. You didn't do that on Star Trek. Uh, I should have. Dun, 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 dun. No, but anyway, I saw it at the Walter Reed Cinema, and I could not believe how bad the print was. There were six scratches throughout. It was in pinko vision, and the entire scene where they're fighting is cut out of What's the with print. all these communist references? Pinko? Hey, I, I watched too much I mean, I, I, I've watched too much on the comrade. Or not, but yes. there was actually a part edited out where Franciscus and Nova are completely naked because I saw a still of that from the shoot. Really? When they're brought in as slaves, mm -hmm. they're completely nude. Uh, and I thought, well, you can't really pull that off in a in a PG. Got to love Mike. Thanks PG. for the nudity Thank you. reference. Well, anyway, I think the film is I, 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 the the silliest moment out of it though is really the uh, the the bomb. Is a, is a giant bullet. 
I kind of like that they worship it as a god. Yeah, it's a. But it's like, but it's like a, a retro, you know, a idea of a bomb. Well, you know, it's like forget. it's that thing that could either have been some science fiction movies, either be an A bomb or it could be a spaceship. Well, look, it's yeah. that like interchangeable like design. To me, it looked like it looked, it looked like a boiler. To me, um, it looked like a big bullet. But and, uh, and I found it also hard to believe that one big bullet would destroy the entire planet. Yeah, well, it's definitely my favorite entry in the series. It's not the best. I think the Planet of the Apes, the first one, is the best. But this is definitely my favorite. I, I like the actor it. who also played the um, the military. Junta leader, the gorilla. The only human, good human, is a dead human. Yeah. yeah I, I well, what was that mind. actor's name? He's, I can't remember if yeah, he's, he's excellent in it. He always talks like this the, all the time. The problem with the movie, though, there is one problem, is the budget was cut, like, by a third, so a lot of scenes you see, like, there's a scene where, actually, that scene where he goes, the only good human is a dead human, is where a lot of extras are wearing pull-down masks, mm -hmm. and it's so obvious because they're trying to save money. I mean, it's really cool, though, that the, the mutants can set up that whole... Uh, glamour or illusion, uh, um, illusion that uh, apes are being crucified upside down and I thought it was like bleeding pretty, pretty, from their faces. Brilliant for a kitty film, you know. I thought, I mean, wow. By the way, this script I want to give credit was written by Paul Dan Dean, who also I believe was one of the he wrote part of Goldfinger, and he also wrote the next few entries in the series. Um, he did a really good job on the script, and actually, I'm going to give a spoiler here. So if you haven't seen it, spoiler: at the end of the movie, Charlton Heston destroys the world. And uh, that sets up the, the entry for the next film, which a lot of people, some people consider the best of the Planet of the Apes films, but I don't really think so. I think it's my least favorite, which is Escape from Planet of the Apes. Um, somehow Zira and Cornelius have found the spaceship that James Franciscus had in the other film and were, flew it and flew back in time back in time to present day Los Angeles. And I believe, and of course, the, the, it's kind of like Planet of the Apes in reverse, where the apes are now the ones that are like, oh my god, they can talk. You know, like that I wouldn't say it's thing. the worst in this series. I, yeah, Battle, I think, is definitely actually, the worst. Actually, I, I used to agree with you, but I will tell you why when we get to that. Um, I, I, I don't, actually, I think that the, the next couple of films in the series are kind of equal in quality. I, I, think, I think the fish out of water reversal thing is an interesting twist on a the theme. I think it's fairly well done for what it is. I have a my problem with this is that when you take the apes out of that interesting futuristic mm -hmm. world and put them in modern day Los Angeles, it loses its luster completely. That's why what, what bored me with it. I didn't like the yeah, modern day. Yeah, Ricardo Montalban. He was yeah, very good, I but he's, I kinda, he I just kinda, didn't I, do it for me. I, I guess I liked it better than you did. I I, th I think there's some interesting drama. I did love in seeing Sal Mineo in the film. And I th and I and I thought it was interesting. Um, it was an opportunity, basically, for uh, Even though, uh, you can't Roddy so McDowell many. and Kim Hunter to really be front and center, finally. Well, and this sets it up they for did the a next job. And they're really good. I think they good. did a good job. In and it's, it is, I think it's genuinely touching. There's some know? good moments in there, but like I said, I just think taking them the out of the ape child. Yeah. And well, the, actually, Zero gets pregnant with Mama. the ape child, and an ape child who the, probably is going to be the evolution of the new ape race. And, of course, the government freaks out and wants to kill it because they know what happened. Somehow they let out that the world is going to be taken over by apes, and so the government wants to kill it. And um, Eric Braden. Yeah, oh God, from the soap opera actor, was in the German actor. Well, he was actually in another great science fiction movie called The Forbin Project. That's a great one, Colossus. I love it. Yeah. Joseph, Joseph Sargent, um, which actually is another f film about the future, mm -hmm. you know, and artificial intelligence. Kind of a, it's actually very much similar to The Terminator, actually, in terms of Skynet, you know, the two computers yeah, becoming aware. Yeah, yeah, it is, actually. That's a good comparison. Um, but the reason I don't like the plus one, I mean, there's some good moments in there. But I will say I, I did like the performance of Ricardo Montalban, and I was sorry to see this was the last we saw of Kim Hunter in the series, as well for obvious reasons. Um, anyway, at the end of the film, it I is a lot. It is a logical sequel if you had to force a sequel from Beneath Planet of the Apes. It is a logical one because there's no way they're going to go to another planet. Or I agree. Something. I agree. It's just I, I wish it could have been done. Or have apes and, on an and Bradford Bradford Dillman. I always love Bradford Dillman. For once, well, one of rare opportunities to get to play the good guy. Oh, that's very rare. You know, it's always he's always in a Dirty Harry film. It's like, you're, like, you know what? Uh, what is that that opinion? Opinions are like assholes. Everyone's got one. That, that's yeah, he's always yeah. like a douchebag. Yeah, but um, he always plays like the corrupt businessman. Well, the, anyway, I want, we'll get to the next one. Um, you're a little douchebag crazy, aren't you? I know. No, but uh, sorry. Dillman's a at the end, Zero gives Communist birth crazy, to the baby, and, Dole and somehow he gives the baby to Ricardo Montalban at the, zoo, the circus, and the baby lives and says, "Mom." At the end, of course, that's up to sets up the sequel, which is directed by uh, Jay Lee Thompson, who was a very good director in the '60s, who directed uh, Guns and Navarone mm -hmm. and many other films. He was a Canadian director, uh, and actually does a very interesting 
a very good job with this one, actually. They filmed it on the newly developed Century City, which is an office building, uh, office lot in L.A. that was new at the time, very futuristic looking, and they got a lot of futuristic look from this, this new location. Um, when they originally filmed it, it was so bloody and violent that it had to be recut uh, because the people at the audiences were walking out on the film. Actually, it was just released on Blu-ray and actually was on the Fox Movie Channel, the uncut version, for the first time because it was rumored to exist. Mm -hmm. But actually, I saw the uncut version. And let me tell you something. It is very, very violent. It actually... A very what? Very violent. It's very, very, very violent. violent. It's actually... J. Lee Thompson said that he was influenced by the Rots Wyatts where you see the apes mm -hmm. are, uh, rebel, and there's... I mean, you see the, the apes' heads being bashed in and blood you everywhere. You just said Rots Wyatts. Watts riots. Ricardo Montalbion. <laughs> that just could me off riots. a little bit. It was the other one. Con. No, that's actually that's not him. Uh, but I, okay, you know, yeah, but let's go back to the original one, one that we've actually saw for the first time, and probably which a lot of people have seen. It, it feels rushed. It feels sloppy. Uh, it feels like there wasn't that much. It feels like there wasn't much thought put into oh, the plot. I mean, really, I, one of the only real highlights of this film is to see John Huston give that like little monologue. That's actually the next film. Um, that's, a, that's a battle. What am I thinking of? You're thinking of Battle of Planet of the Apes for the sequel. So this is Conquest of Planet of the Apes. This is where... Conquest. Conquest basically... I'm sorry. Uh, Roddy McDowell is the son of Cornelius. Cornelius. And he becomes Caesar. And he hides the fact that he's intelligent. And uh, Ricardo Montalbion takes him to the city because he has to go there on business. Mm -hmm. And it's a futuristic police state, kind of like, you know... And uh, there was a virus that had killed all the animals, pets, like cats and dogs. And so humans now have apes as pets. And they've also trained them to be like slaves, mm -hmm. kind of like a plantation, you know. They, and you know, um, I haven't seen this one. The, for it's, ages. Yeah, it's a very good film, actually. And the uncut version, I said, is even better. Um, I like the way that um, you actually. This is like a transition where you see the apes start to rebel and mm -hmm. build resistance against the humans. And there's some very tense moments, and it's very well directed by J. Lee Thompson. I mean, it is very tense. Some of the scenes in there are just really. Creepy, like when the scenes where they're trying to barricade themselves away from the apes, and the apes are just going ape shit. No pun intended. Um, well, I don't. I, I didn't mind Conquest. Conquest when, is one of my it. one of the I, one I, of the best entries in the series, actually. I think. What about okay? What now, did what you did you think? guys think of Conquest? Um, I liked it. Um, I when you said that, but you're talking about another film. I felt this one felt rushed. I felt that you started to see them just you know let's just get this out there because it's another Planet of the Apes film. I think it could have been a better film. Mm -hmm. than what they wound up putting out there. Um, yeah, but just wait for the next one. However, Roddy McDowell is very good at it. He carries the film. He car He really does carry the film. And and it's an interesting sort of subversion of the character he was playing in the previous uh, Planet of the Apes, where he truly is front and center the hero. Well, he is the son and of... And he's a proactive hero. The son of his father, so he's basically playing his, the son of the character. He's almost like a Malcolm X type character. He, is. he very he much is. And... and 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 he and it's it's a very interesting thing, and there are sympathetic humans in, in the in the movie, just like you know R Ricardo Montalban isn't the only one. Um, for some reason, I don't find the movie particularly memorable. For some, you know, it's like I saw I would have it recently because I'm having I'm really surprised. Myself. I'm surprised but, you guys don't remember the but I thought that. It's been I, like ten years. It's just a a, for some reason I, when you go from play, like like a presentation of the future in Planet of the Apes. Part of what the advantage that film had that it took place so far in the future, you could probably get away with anything. Mm -hmm. The whole desert, you know, planet, everyone's, you know, just dressed down to, you know, just, you know, their skivvies, whatever. Whereas in a film like this, it was supposed to be in the near future, and it has that dated 70s concept of what the near future would look like kind of thing. Yeah, every, every, and, and, and it looks really, like in the Century Ryan City set, it's like, it really shows that that's the only set they use, and they're constantly reusing the same I shots to try to make it look the different. The same office and, building. But and like, after a while, that off. started to like take me out of the film. It's a one point five million dollar movie. I thought they did. It. I mean, it got very good production value out of it. I thought. See, let me tell you okay, something too. We're talking too much the about end, Conquest. Uh, before I go, though, but the, the original ending, like I said, there's a very infamous speech that Cornelius gives, and it's very bleak. Like we are going to dominate human and whatever, and it was redubbed to the version you guys saw, where we can show humans mm -hmm. compassion and get mm -hmm. the law together. The other one is much more bleak. It's on Blu-ray, and it was on the Fox Movie Channel. I highly recommend you seek it out. Now, let's go to the next one. Battle. Which, Battle for the Planet of the Apes, which was the last entry in the series, and it was a very, suffered from a very low budget. J. Lee Thompson came back, and it was this one was, the story was written by Paul Dean, who wrote the previous three entries. Um, but there wasn't enough time. Uh, he could, he had problems with the script, so they went to Joyce and William Corrington, who wrote the Omega Man script. And uh, this one, unfortunately, is a very low-budget affair, and it suffers very much from pre-release cutting. 
the, it's the, the version that was released to theaters is like 10 minutes shorter. And the uncut version did finally get released on DVD, which actually makes a lot more sense. There's a lot of plot holes and gaps. There is there is a lot of plot holes, and this feels just sloppy and rushed. It's and also a really boring movie. Yeah, it is terribly it's really, boring. It's the only one that I wasn't... All the other ones before was watchable. I could sit from beginning to end with no problem, even if I had issues with some things that were going on. This one, I, was, I just kept isn't walking away from the TV. Yes, he is. Yeah, I kept walking ape away from the TV. Ape never kill ape. Yeah, and that's Claude right. Akins is also in it, who's very good, actually. Is all and, and John Houston's monologue. John Houston is the lawgiver. Who was supposed lawgiver. to be Edward G. Robinson until he died. <laughs> yeah, but it's, uh, the, the law, I don't know if that's true. But uh, but anyway, anyway, John Houston is terrific. Now, I said the last one isn't particularly memorable to me. This one, I can't remember shit. Well, I, they, mean, I can remember that it just there was are very no, crude. Everything was crude, almost Road Warrior-esque without... And the human characters, there's none of the actors playing the roles are particularly charismatic. I do think Austin Stoker is very good. But I can't else, remember I can't any of the humans from this film at I, all. I, I, I also still was the black actor. In who, fact, for, for the longest time, I would confuse episodes from, from the TV series. It does look like one of the being TV a films. part of this film and vice versa. It know? feels like the TV show because the, the masks are a little cheaper. And unfortunately, they didn't have much money. But I thought for the budget they had, they did an okay job. And the uncut version, I am going to be honest with you, I didn't like it until I saw it. <laughs> the uncut version, I mean, until I saw the uncut version, I thought it was much better and it is fleshed out, makes a lot more sense. It's what not... uncut version don't you like? No, no, because there's stuff every that's... single uncut movie you've seen you've enjoyed much more yeah. than the original. Well, we gotta wrap this up in a sec, but before we do, Tim Burton's bat, uh, Batman. Well, no, no, Tim Burton's we'll, 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 we'll do a little a rejoinder. We'll do on a little this. mini review later for that. But no, this one is a good is a, is an interesting one. The uncut is just because it fleshes out stuff. It really makes more like, sense. For instance, We're gonna do a mini review what, what on, Tim, on Tim Burton's <laughs> Planet of the Apes. Why would we do that? Why not? I can add it for the web. Does anybody really want to hear it? Yes. Well, anyway, but no, the the the. The, 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 the humans are about, you know, they, because they go in the underground the city. Wahlberg fans. Hey, I'm telling you, they go to the underground city and the hu they have the bomb there and they're about to detonate it and they're going to destroy all the apes and they decide not to uh, because of. But uh, really, credits. does that make the film better? It does because it gives more motivation, fleshes out quite a bit. I think it's a lot better. Anyway. Yeah, but that does still make it a good film. It's not. It's not. It may make great, it better, good. But it's a lot better. It a it's still film. a weak film, but it's better than Escape from right. Planet of the Apes, which is my fa least favorite of the series. Well, I probably won't be checking that one out. So, but anyway, uh, stay tuned. Stay we'll, tuned for our mini review. We'll do a mini of review of the Tim Burton's Planet of the Apes because we ran out of because we ran out of topics to talk about later on. Because too. not only are we horrible at interpersonal communication, thus no Jeff, we're horrible at timekeeping. Until next week or next show, mini-review, I'm Edwin Samuelson.